It's my immense pleasure to introduce Professor Petra Seiperstein today as the first keynote speaker to start off our biennial uh, society for the Medieval Mediterranean Conference. Professor Seiperstein's work on early Islamic documents has really transformed our understanding of the experiences of Muslims and non-Muslims in the early Islamic era. When you go to conferences in the field, it usually doesn't take very long until Petra's name comes up uh, in one of the panels, uh, so her work's constantly referenced. Um, and um, she is a professor of Arabic at Leiden University. She received her um, a master's from Leiden University and her PhD from Princeton. Um, and starting in 2007, 2017, uh, she uh, manages an international research project that is entitled Embedding Conquest, Naturalizing Muslim Rule in the Early Islamic Empire, 600 to 1,000, which is funded by the European Research Council. And again, I'll continue my absolute shameless promotion of the journal of al Mazak because I can also introduce Petra to you as the editor, the special editor of the special issue uh, in Al-Masak, which focuses on hair in the medieval Muslim world. And um, when we talked about inviting Petra, this was last summer, we showed amazing foresight because I just received a report from Taylor and Francis about our top 10 downloads and uh, our top num number one download last year was Pepper Seiberstein's article on shaving hair and beards in early Islamic Egypt with 749 downloads. And not only that, the top two article was Petra Seiberstein, um, yes, beards, braids, and mustaches, which was the introduction. So we have really invited the most important contributor to Al-Masak to give the keynote here, which is so wonderful. And um, I'm handing over to Petra, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you uh, so much, Miriam. I had actually um, put the Al-Masak uh, journal, I said that issue, in my talk and took it out in the end, so I'm very happy that you mentioned it to say how I've already kind of pushed the borders or the boundaries of the Mediterranean, um, medieval Mediterranean when I was uh, um, editing that, vo that volume of El Masak because it uh, includes, uh, for example, on, on uh, um, I said, Coptic monks, but also uh, Sufis from um, Persia and also some Iraqi literary discussions. So I'm uh, in it quite at home at uh, moving from the east to the west and saying it's all part of the Mediterranean. So, thank you for having me. I'll come back to that point. Oh. Green is next. Can you get me to the next slide? Oh, Abu Jafar. Can you do it? Ah, oh, yes, okay. Oh, Abu Jafar. If only you could see the confusion and anxiety that people feel here now. Both sailors and others are taken away. They took everyone they could get hold of. Every day they come from a different place with troops to get us. I ask God relief by his mercy. This is a citation from an Arabic letter preserved on papyrus and found in Egypt. It's, date, it's, it's dated circa 854 CE, and it was written by an inhabitant of Damietta, a town in the Egyptian delta, located on one of the Nile arms, about 15 kilometers land inward from the Mediterranean coast. The chaos and confusion that the writer describes were the result of the surprise attack by the Byzantine fleet on the city of Damietta in 853, so a year earlier, and which was followed by yearly raids. So you can assume this was written at one of these raids following the first initial attack. The assaults on Egyptian towns announced the rise of the Byzantine Empire under the so-called Macedonian emperors in the late 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. Having regained political stability, the Byzantines initiated aggressive warfare in the Eastern Mediterranean to recover Cyprus, Rhodes, and Crete from the Arabs. They also launched attacks 
on the southern shores of the Mediterranean against Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and North Africa in an attempt to harm the caliphate that supplied the islands. But despite the devastation and disruptions that these attacks caused, as the letter quoted above proves, the Byzantines did not manage to establish a lasting presence on the mainland nor on the islands. They took them much later. This is, of course, how we generally study the Mediterranean and the movement of people, goods, and ideas across it. That is to say, the military fleets, commercial vessels, and the soldiers, diplomats, scholars, pilgrims, and adventurers who traveled on board with their luggage, gifts, souvenirs, commercial wear, and other possessions. The routes that connected the shores of the sea, the nodes where routes crossed and came together, and the flows that determined the direction, volume, and location of activity in the sea. They are all studied within the confines of the Mediterranean itself, with the political, military, and connected social economic developments that took place on the shores around it, determining the course, character, quantity, and organization of movements in and across the sea. But what I would like to show you this afternoon is that movement in the Mediterranean, even in the period from the 6th to the 10th century CE, which is what I focus on, was determined not only by the local context, but that events and processes taking place much further afield had an impact as well. I contend that the Mediterranean in this period operated within a global system in which exchanges had sufficient volume and frequency to create an entangled connectedness over an extended geographical space. Incidents and changes on one end of the interconnected network of exchanges and contacts impacted the situation on the other end. I would like to illustrate this by focusing on two periods. First, the Arab conquest uh, in the mid seventh century, including the period right before and after it. And secondly, the ninth century, when our wretched letter writer reported on the Byzantine attack on Damietta. He will go when it gets really uh, noisy. <laughs> it's my son. <laughs> I rely hereby on information from documents on papyrus, archaeological sources, and historiography, but also on theories of globalization, and especially on how the interaction between global and local processes created related and general, but at the same time, localized contexts. I'm especially pleased to be able to present my work here at the sixth biennial conference of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean, where the very diverse papers on the theme of movement and mobility this year provide the perfect context for my talk. If you're judged by the company you keep, being here amongst all of you places me, I think, in a very fortunate position. The entanglements and connections across the Mediterranean that will be dealt with in the next couple of days, in many cases, show exactly the kind of elongated extension into other areas that I'm interested in. Whether it is through pilgrimage from Al-Andalus to Arabia, or the transporting of relics from the eastern to the western half of the Mediterranean that contain precious metal materials produced with techniques that arrived in the Mediterranean via long distance trade works, trade networks. So I should thank Roser and the other organizers of this year's meeting for having included me as a speaker in your midst. Although I might operate at the earlier end of the medieval spectrum and push the boundaries of the Mediterranean far into the world beyond. So let us start with the great Arab conquest of the seventh century, or rather with the period directly before and directly after it. Because as you will see, the Arab conquest as such might have been less eventful in relation to mobility in the Mediterranean than otherwise thought. Objects found in Merovingian graves, as well as other goods recovered from archaeological sites in Western Europe, show a variety of imported commodities. Red garnets, amethyst beads and spices from Sri Lanka and India, incense from Arabia and cowrie shells from the Red Sea, not all in this picture, huh? 
ivory from Africa, as well as fine ceramics, such as North African and Fokian red slipware, amphorae and their contents, especially olive oil and wine from Palestine and Syria, um, glass and bronze objects from Egypt, and meerschaum, glass and silver objects, and textiles from the Eastern Mediterranean. All of these, based on these finds in graves and in other places uh, from Western Europe, all these circulated in large quantities, reaching a peak in around 600 CE, and were found in all social layers, judging by their finding places. Shortly after the turn, or at the turn of the seventh century, so a little bit afterwards, however, a noticeable change takes place in the trade in luxury goods in the Indian Ocean, Red Sea, and Mediterranean. Again, the shift can be best observed in the kinds of goods found in graves and other places in France and elsewhere in Western Europe. This is from grave finds. As I mentioned, until that time, so this is actually from the earlier period still, grave goods, jewelry, and weapons belonging to the dead were made with objects that came from far away. Cowrie shells, glass beads, red garnets, and other precious stones traveled from South Asia, Sri Lanka, and India to the Frankish lands via the Indian Ocean, Red Sea, and the Mediterranean, with Egypt being an important throughway. The products were brought on land in the great Egyptian Red Sea harbor towns, such as Berenike, located in the eastern desert of Egypt. And as you can see, local craftsmen used the precious stones and shells to make luxury objects, which fitted local tastes and needs. But shortly after 600, something changes in this connected network. The goods from India and Sri Lanka, so from South Asia, disappear from the graves in France, and the Egyptian Red Sea port cities decline sharply. At the same time, luxury goods made in the Eastern Mediterranean continued to be found in Western Europe into the seventh century and beyond. I'm talking, for example, about Egyptian bronze vessels, Egyptian so-called millefiori beads, up there, and other objects, such as these bronze weights, that's on the right, the image on the right, bronze weights for scales, which were found in modern-day Flanders, Belgium, the Low Countries, my, my place. They date to the 8th century CE. They were found in a Frankish and Merovingian settlement but were made in Egypt. Also, wine and oil from the Eastern Mediterranean, especially from Palestine, continued to be imported into France, as the fine spots of amphorae indicate. It is also corroborated by evidence from shipwrecks. For example, there's a really famous one found um, near Port Cross in the Provence in southern France, which contained wine amphorae from Palestine. While the number of objects imported from North Africa, Egypt, and Palestine definitely into Europe, uh, into Western Europe, diminish at this time, both in terms of quantity and variation, and are found in fewer places, they do not, and this is the important point, disappear entirely. Merovingian graves, moreover, show that black garnets, which are found in Eastern Europe, replace the red garnet ones from Sri Lanka and India. This suggests also that the demand for garnets did not diminish, but that they were now brought from elsewhere. And in Egypt itself, luxury ceramics that used to be imported via the Red Sea ports make place for locally produced wares that imitate these ones that used to be brought in from outside. In other words, an internal Egyptian market continued to produce and consume products, including luxury ones, for an internal and an export market. Oh, these bronze vessels are made in Egypt and then exported into Europe. In Europe, there continued to be a demand, albeit less large than previously, for foreign luxury goods. On the other hand, the influx of such goods from South Asia, and with it the trade via the Indian ocean and Red Sea seems to have stagnated for some reason, starting in the late 6th century and having really an effect in these grave goods in the early 7th. 
So the decline of the Red Sea trade in luxury goods and the disappearance of South Asian goods from European sites in the early 7th century doesn't seem to be the result of an economic decay in the Byzantine Empire and its province, Egypt. It was also not the result of a total collapse of the market in Europe. But where should we then look for an explanation? Interestingly, oops, yeah. um, interestingly, in this period, the great Gupta Empire in southern India collapsed, bringing an end to India's so-called golden era. Sri Lanka at this time, and connected to it, to this collapse of the Gupta Empire, witnessed political and economic disruption due to dynastic struggles and invasions from the mainland. The political turmoil caused an economic breakdown in the region, interrupting the production and export of luxury goods via the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea to Egypt. Simultaneously, an aggressive commercial policy from the Sasanian Empire benefited Sasanian mer merchants at the expense of Byzantine traders. Sasanian political military activities, such as the Sasanian takeover in Yemen at the end of the 6th century, stimulated overland trade via Central Asia. And it has even been suggested that that invasion in Yemen by the Sasanian Empire was actually um, designed to actively undermine the Red Sea trade routes. It is the disruption of channels of trade and production centers hundreds of miles away that had an impact on the luxury trade via Egypt across the Mediter Mediterranean to Europe. Of course, an economic downturn in Western Europe and North Africa, as well as indications that European taste in grave goods was changing in this period, also had an impact on consumption patterns. But the turmoil in South and Central Asia that redirected the su supply and transport of trade products must have had a hugely important impact as well. It is exactly this kind of connectivity in a globalized economy and its long distant of distance effects that I'm talking about. And we find it thus affecting the Mediterranean already in the 6th century CE. This connects to a second phase in the first case study that I would like to discuss. The observation that the disappearance of luxury goods from South Asia is not connected to an economic decline in, Byzant in the Byzantine Empire and its province Egypt has everything to do with the scholarly evaluation of the economic impact of the great Arab conquests of the 7th century. For a long period, scholars explained the unexpected military success of the Arabs in the 7th century by pointing to the weakness of the Byzantine and Sasanian empires. How else would the Arabs, inhabitants of the desert with no governmental experience and military organization, have been able to overrun these centuries old empires? The explanation was sought in the economic decline that supposedly hit the Eastern Mediterranean in the sixth century. The Byzantine empire in this view fell to the Arabs because it had already decayed not because the Arabs inflicted mortal wounds. According to this theory, the Arab conquest only reinforced this downward turn in the economy of the region. The French scholar, Henri Pirenne, sorry, he's been you know, well known, but still, to return to him, argued, of course, as is well known, that the establishment of the caliphate separated the northwestern half of the Mediterranean from its southeast borders and isolated Europe from the Levant and North Africa. According to Piren, this, this split across the Mediterranean caused Europe and the Middle East to move in very different directions in their subsequent histories. Archaeological and historical finds do not support the idea that all contacts across the Mediterranean came to a halt after the establishment of the Caliphate. And many people have written about that, of course. On the contrary, it is clear that cultural and commercial exchanges continued to take place across the Mediterranean and that the region remained connected to an extensive network spanning South Asia and Western Europe throughout this period. At the same time, as I will show, the center of this activity moved through the Mediterranean with the rise and fall of political powers in the region and, and this is my point today, beyond 
In other words, contact and exchange continue to take place across the Mediterranean, but the lines along which these contacts took place and the flows which they precipitated were not the same throughout the centuries. The location and direction changed, as well as the volume and character of goods moving along them. But this is the important point. Against Piren, it was not according to religious lines or not following religious uh, I say that? Uh, groupings. The Caliphate had its capital in Damascus, in Syria, starting in 660 CE, under the Umayyad, Umayyad dynasty. Umayyad's rule covered a region extending from the Atlantic Ocean in the west to the Indian subcontinent in the east, an enormous area. It, did, it joined areas that used to belong to the Byzantine and the Sasanian empires that had never before been joined. Public works, for example, the great monuments like the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, the mosques in Medina and Damascus, but also the establishment of roads and routes with all their buildings, wells, bridges, to Mecca to facilitate the Hajj, the yearly pilgrimage, stimulated the economy within this huge area. Some of these investments directly facilitated trade, such as roads, markets, bridges, and other infrastructures. Take a look at these two inscriptions from the early 8th century from Palestine. The one on the right records the restoration of a mountain pass near modern-day Aqaba uh, on the Hajj route, and was also part of the development of the route um, to Mecca, under the Caliph Abdul Malik, who ruled from 685 to 705. And the second one, uh, on the left, commemorates the establishment of a building which served as a public market in the town of Baisan, the ancient Skitopolis, uh, also in Palestine, under the Caliph Hisham, who ruled a bit later from 724 to 743. Uh, so it actually says the building to be built, but it was, we know it was part of a, it was the market building, so that's why I changed it a bit. The Muslim army was another motor of economic activity. See, for example, the garrison cum administrative capitals that were erected in the provinces with all the public facilities and infrastructure that they required, the building of a fleet, but also the payment in cash to soldiers. This is something that Hugh Kennedy has been working on recently, how important that was, that all these soldiers in the Muslim army actually got a salary in cash and could, had to spend it. Huh? They had to buy food and do everything locally and how, how that Im, um, impacted um, the local economy. The progressing Arab armies, which recruited soldiers and with them different tastes, customs and cultures as they moved from region to region, was an important factor in the movement of products, techniques and practices across the empire. A nice example is the production and consumption of wine. We already mentioned that Palestinian wine was exported throughout the Mediterranean in late antiquity. Documentary evidence, archaeological sources, and literary references point to a continuous or even increased production and consumption of wine in the Mediterranean provinces of the Islamic Empire, involving also the Caliph household. Palestinian viticulture expanded significantly after the Arab conquest in the second half of the 7th and into the 8th century. And I'm relying here on the work of Gideon Afni, an archeologist from Jerusalem. One of the places to which this Palestinian wine was exported was apparently Egypt. A surge in Palestinian wine amphorae in the 7th to 8th centuries found in Egypt suggests that the Arab conquerors, amongst whom uh, were also many Arab inhabitants of the Levant, who had joined the conquering armies, uh, the Arab armies, also brought their taste in Palestinian wine with them to the places they captured and where they settled. Evidence also comes from written sources, such as agricultural contracts. A Greek papyrus dating to 698 CE contains a labor contract for work on a vineyard located in the Fayum oasis in Egypt that belongs to the caliph who was at that moment seated in Damascus. Arabic papyri from Egypt also show that the use of the so-called boiled wine or grape syrup increased dramatically. This was requested for civil servants and sailors on the Arab fleet. 
both Muslims and non-Muslims. And we can also point, of course, to the development of a special genre of Arabic wine poetry, which flourished already at the Umayyad courts. But Palestinian goods were, pop were a popular commodity elsewhere in the Mediterranean as well at this time. We can re reconstruct this from a shipwreck found off the Israeli coast at the ancient site of Dor, Tantura, modern, uh, modern name Tantura. It dates to the end of the 7th or beginning of the 8th century and contained a variety of goods on board. Amphorae and juglets produced in Egypt and Cyprus or southern Turkey and a large amount of fish bones, probably the remains of preserved fish, such as the salted fish paste or garum produced commercially, as well as various other foodstuffs. The wares on board, the archaeologists have reconstructed, connect the boat to southern Spain, North Africa, Egypt, Cyprus, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. But we do not know, unfortunately, the exact route it would have taken. And the small size of the boat suggests that it was engaged in regional trade rather than long distance commercial activity and that it moved along the coast rather than across the sea from shore to shore, but still it came everywhere, or at least the goods on board came from everywhere. So while wine consumption along the southern shores of the Mediterranean continued or even increased under the Umayyad caliphs, trade activity across the Mediterranean was dominated by regional rather than long distance activities. The public works undertaken by the Umayyad Caliphate were also, like these ones huh, I was referring to, were also concentrated in the core area of the empire, Syria, where the caliphal capital was located, and the Hejaz, where the holy cities of Mecca and Medina were found, and locally around the new provincial capitals that also functioned as garrisons. Indeed, we cannot see yet the kind of large-scale economic boom that characterizes the Abbasid period, which we will discuss in a minute. As I mentioned above, the breakdown in trans-Mediterranean trade is generally linked with the rise of the Islamic Empire and its animosity towards the powers on the northern shores of the sea. A parting of the ways of two political powers that were ideologically opposed in this view coked off economic and other exchange, resulting in a halt of movement and mobility across the sea. But scholars, even when they've rejected you know, this ideological opposition that came with Piren, still point often at a direct effect of this animosity to explain why trade activities across the Mediterranean declined, namely the diminished security due to constant warfare. So even if they say, okay, there continue to be, uh, we find these archeological um, traces that show that there are connections, they will still say when they, uh, actually in the discussion of this, this shipwreck, for example, okay, local trade, yes, of course, because there was constant warfare. Uh, these two big ideologically opposed powers on both sides of the Mediterranean, they were at constant war. Um, Surely, the continuous state of war that existed between the Islamic and Byzantine Empire from the mid-7th to the early 8th century played a role. Annual raids and na naval attacks, both by the Byzantines trying to regain control of the areas they had recently lost, and by the Arabs attempting to expand their empire by capturing the Byzantine capital, did take place. And this situation doubtlessly created unrest at sea, and it had a deteriorating effect on the coastal areas that bore the burden of the attacks. Well, we can, even though it's later, um, point to this papyrus letter again. You know, the, the impact of such a raid is not to be um, underestimated. But what's important, I think, to note is that these annual raids, their annual raids, occurred within a limited period and were rather concentrated affairs. I mean, it's not one, when I say annual rates, I mean, there could be several, but it's during a short period, and they were concentrated, one town at a time, or a couple. So while the state of warfare was indeed permanent, actual battles were not a continuous feature of daily life. And I don't think so, I also don't think we should look there when we want to explain, you know, why trade across the Mediterranean um, was not taking place anymore at such a large scale. A much more important factor, it seems to me, for explaining why the large-scale development of commercial activities lagged behind the establishment of one large caliphate 
is exactly the effort involved in state building that absorbed the Islamic empire as a whole. The administrative and political ideological reforms and the internal struggles that accompanied them in the Islamic empire sucked up the money, attention, and energy of all inhabitants of the caliphate. Oh. From Egypt to Iraq, we read about inhabitants who complain about the increased tax burden that was the result of an empire-wide fiscal administrative reform at the turn of the 8th century. Large-scale surveys, land surveys, censuses, and other measures were initiated to collect more rigorously and more accurately the taxes due on lands, people, and property. Subjects reacted to the increased fiscal pressure and an expanding state apparatus because these surveys brought, of course, huh, representatives of the state to all the little villages and lands all across, and tax collectors. So they, they reacted to this with rebellions and revolts. So it's both an increased fiscal um, pressure, but also, uh, Yaakov Lev has shown this very well, an increased presence of the Muslim state. And then there is the Umayyad Caliph's attempt at imposing their version of political cum religious rule over the whole Muslim community, which created other kinds of protests as well. There were alternative roads to salvation and disagreements about methods of succession, which brought about civil wars and even the existence of multiple caliphs at once. This all challenged the caliphal enterprise and cost the parties involved heavily in military and related expenses. Again, events that occurred beyond the direct confines of the Mediterranean had an impact on mobility across the sea. Measures taken in Damascus had repercussions all across the empire, necessitating the redirection of funds and men to other areas. And the Muslim Caliphate was busy trying to impose this idea of a, or impose and implement state uh, infrastructure. Um, and fighting the, the resistance that this caused. At the same time, the local context of the direct environment of the Mediterranean shaped how these elements played out locally. In other words, events that took place far beyond the Mediterranean had an impact, but what this impact looked like was, looked like was determined locally. And this is exactly what we find in the second case study that I want to examine with you the collapse of the Abbasid Empire, and how it affected movement in and across the Mediterranean in the 9th and 10th centuries. So the Abbasid dynasty came to power in 750 CE on a program of reform to counter some of the problems that had plagued their Umayyad predecessors. This is just a nice, different picture to look at. In the Abbasid Caliphate, economic activity flourished. These kind of ships going around. <laughs> resulting in new products and techniques developing and moving rapidly across the vast area of the caliphate. This had many reasons. Economic stimulus came from the safety, unity, and rest that followed the initial period of regime change. One economic, legal, and political system governed the area. The royal court at Baghdad, the new capital located in Iraq, and satellite courts in urban centers throughout the caliphate stimulated the demand for luxury goods. With the move of the political center to the east, the presence of eastern products and other influences increased even more. At the same time, the production of valuable objects such as glass, metalworks, and ceramics increased dramatically. Technical and artistic innovations met the growing demand for these objects within the caliphate and also outside as Abbasid objects were exported to the East and West. For example, Tang China, we find a lot of Abbasid ceramics which are, uh, were popular there, so brought that way. And I will talk about them coming to the Mediterranean as well. From the capital Baghdad, an Abbasid common culture radiated out, finding local expression in regional urban centers. In other words, a shared cultural realm extended across the caliphate and even beyond its borders, thanks to good, goods, people, and ideas moving around faster and in greater qualities. But this was not a static and uniform culture. Regional forms continued to develop along their own trajectories and influenced by imperial practices, practices but also circling back to have their impact on the center. So it's a continuous movement back and forth. 
For example, in the Anatolian town of Tarsus, as Yasmin Bakshi's study into the ceramics of that site shows, local 9th century pottery workshops developed a distinctive local form based on widely popular Abbasid pottery styles and shapes. So on the one hand, this is quite well recognizable as Abbasid pottery, but it has a local interpretation and materials even used. We see this also in the increase in the use of silk in Egypt. Take a look at this 8th century papyrus letter found in Egypt. A certain Matar ibn Abd al-Samad ordered silk thread in five colors, yellow, red, green, sky blue, and white, to produce a piece of brocade. So this 8th century, early 8th century. Silk was manufactured in Egypt, but only in very small quantities, and it was never of a very good quality. Definitely not that you would make brocade, you know, like nice embroidery. In addition, in the Byzantine Empire, the use of silk was reserved for the highest classes by law. Under Islam, where such a limitation on the use of silk did not exist, and there are other discussions in the theology, in Islamic theology about the use of silk, but definitely not according to social classes, the use of silk increased dramatically in the Islamic empire, as archeological finds show. The popularity of silks was so great that even embroidery techniques developed for silk were used on other materials such as wool, as has been shown on textiles found in Egypt. So together with the materials, huh, with the um, embroidered silks that were introduced to Egypt, these techniques were then taken over, but even used on local, locally on local, uh, locally made products. These silk fabrics, like the threads ordered in the papyrus letters, were imported from the East. Eventually, silk production spread throughout the Mediterranean and became especially important in Al-Andalus, from where it was then exported to the Eastern Mediterranean, including Egypt. I mean, silks from here were, of course, famous. But that's later, we'll get to that. But before that time, silk fabrics produced in the Eastern, province of, of Eastern provinces of the Muslim Empire or imported from even further East also made their way across the Mediterranean to Europe. They were treasured as extremely precious objects, deposited in church treasuries where they protected relics, were incorporated into the ecclesiastical or royal regalia, or clothed the bodies of rich Christians. And this is, of course, not something that was restricted to the early period but continued later on. A lot of these silks were actually brought by crusaders, as we know, to Europe. But see, for example, this silk fragment. It was produced in Central Asia or Iran in the 7th or 8th century. And this is actually from the Victorian Albert, this piece is from the Victorian Albert Museum, but, and they don't know where, the, where theirs comes from, but parts of exactly the same weaving, so you know, cut off from the same piece of silk, found their way, they were actually still in situ, in Paris, where they were associated with the relics of St. Helena and St. Liu. In other words, Techniques and products moved around across a wide network, but needs, tastes, and preferences determined how these were applied locally on both sides of the Mediterranean. Now to the 9th century. As archaeological sources show, Indian Ocean trade increased dramatically in the 9th and 10th centuries. This was stimulated by the rising demand from the Abbasid Empire, but also, as I mentioned, by increased activity in China. So the Tang Dynasty started a bit earlier, but was uh, demanded also objects. Objects moved in both directions as industries developed and consumption rose on both sides of the Indian Ocean. In and around the Mediterranean, too, the 9th century witnessed an increase in commercial activities. In the eastern half of the Mediterranean, Byzantine ceramics workshops start to increase the production of new and develop new styles that moved along routes extending from the Aegean via Constantinople into the Black Sea region. So staying in the northeastern side, but still. And also we have Islamic coins found on the eastern Italian coast, uh, dating to the ninth century, albeit at this time still in sm very small quantities. But they also point to a rising commercial activity in Italian cities such as Venice with 
the Islamic and um, Islamic sides. But by the ninth century, however, it was the western half of the Mediterranean, including Sicily, the Maghreb, and the Iberian Peninsula, where this trade activity was dominant. And this is a point I will get back to. Meanwhile, in Egypt, as mentioned before, the demand for luxury goods had not diminished during this period at all. Local products had temporarily replaced those that were brought in from afar. Now that trade routes in the east were restored, Abbasid artisans inside the caliphate produced and developed products of superb quality, and demand in the Mediterranean region increased, Egypt started to play a role again in the import of luxury goods from far away. So like the silk that was brought in in the 8th century and local products that were uh, uh, produced to fulfill local demand, now that there was you know, kind of an export market again, we see that this trait is developed in a, in a larger scale. And thus, we see indeed that in the 9th century, Red Sea ports become active again. Those Red Sea harbors, however, are not found in the same cities that flourished under the Romans. And this is because these new harbors, um, which were located in different places on the Red Sea coast, because they served not only the traders, but also pilgrims to Mecca. So they also had to be uh, on a good place to go to Mecca. The Abbasid boom benefited trade activity across the Islamic empire within a global economic system. Goods moved from beyond the empire's borders via safe and well-maintained trade routes over land and sea in a network that connected Western Europe with North and East Africa, Arabia, and Central and South Asia. How interconnected this world exactly was is clear from a description from one extreme of the network, which takes us back to the main theme of my talk, how developments much further afield affected mobility in the Mediterranean. Let us turn to Central Asia. A world-famous textile workshop in Bukhara produced door hangings and carpets that were exported all over the world and that were also very popular at the Caliphal court in Baghdad. In fact, the caliph was so fond of the Bukhara textiles that he had a special tax collector travel yearly to the city who exchanged the taxes raised by the city on the spot for carpets, rugs, cushions, cushions and other clothes produced in this workshop. And these were then transported to Iraq where the caliph could enjoy them. It's also an interesting story about the use of tax, taxes, but anyway. With the collapse of the Baghdadi economy uh, in the second half of the ninth century, or yeah, ninth century, and the caliphal court, however, the fortune of the textile workshop turned. And I quote from the abridged Persian translation of the 10th century Tariq Bukhara, Tariq Bukhara, I want to say, which is the Persian way of saying it, the workshop was abandoned and the people who plied this trade dispersed. In other words, when the market for Bukhara textiles collapsed and the large orders from Baghdad, including those from the caliph himself, dried up, the workshop was unable to sustain business. Huh? Like very interconnected world. What does the collapse of the Baghdadi court have to do with movement and mobility in the Mediterranean, the topic of this conference? And how does it offer a different perspective on the Byzantine attack relayed in the papyrus that I quoted at the beginning of this talk? The breakdown of the caliph's power in Baghdad in the 9th century impacted activities in the Mediterranean in two ways. First, it changed the relationship between the capital of the caliphate and its provinces and dependencies. Several regions, most notably for our purpose, the Muslim Iberian Peninsula and North Africa up to current day Tunisia, operated already largely independently from the caliph for more than a century. That is to say, governors, judges, and other local officials were not appointed from Baghdad, taxes were not sent to the capital, and loyalty to the caliph was to various degrees expressed on coins, in the Friday sermons, and the like. But the but with the breakdown of the caliphal power in the ninth century, local dynasties were established everywhere in the Muslim empire, further diminishing the caliph's income and control. It was a mutually reinforcing process. So a weaker caliph meant that local dynasties could behave independently, but because they didn't send taxes anymore to the caliph, the caliph became weaker, so it reinforced each other. <clears throat> 
Power was transferred, policy made, and income spent without consultation with the caliph in Baghdad. Not only could these semi-independent dynasties make their own decisions in military and political terms without having to send regular monetary tributes to Baghdad, they could invest locally and develop an infrastructure that benefited their own position and that of their dependents. And I was inspired by Antonella's opening remarks and her call to connect our papers in the remote medieval period to contemporary events. And also while walking around here and seeing everywhere the flags, um, unless you think that doing it on your own independently is the way forward, Brexit and all, <laughs> I should say that here, of course, the whole point is that these independent dynasties could spend money locally, but they also benefited from the fact that they were part still of the Islamic empire. So they nominally recognized the caliph. They still used the same legal system. They were all of the same religion, even if they had in the, you know, um, different interpretations. They, ha they had the same economic system, the same cultural, um, I said that, um, vocabulary. And scholars, very famously scholars and literati and, and et cetera, traveled around these courts as if there were no uh, borders and independent dynasties. So I think it's exactly the combination. And so, with these independent uh, dynasties, we by the in the ninth century, we find the Ahlabid dynasty of Tunis fund a fleet to conquer Sicily in 827 CE. This decision was reached in Cairo Wan, uh, the local capital, at the local council meeting, uh, local of the of the local province and of the Ahlabid family. No consultation with the caliph or anything. They were aided, by the way, by the Umayyad Emir of Cordoba, who sent ships as well uh, to, to help the conquest of Sicily. And this reflects the situation, which I already referred to, in which the center of gravity had definitely switched to the western part of the Mediterranean. Uh, so they're not going to Damascus or the Abbasid Caliph or whatever to ask for help to conquer Sicily. No, they, um, the Emir of Cordoba and the Ahlabids go at it together. On the other hand, the Byzantines, remember this is the ninth century, I was saying the, co the attack on Damietta was um, um, inspired by the Byzantines kind of building up their military activities. So the Byzantines who had started, uh, Sicily belonged of course to the Byzantine Empire, who had started their own period of military prowess were nevertheless only able to send a small contingent of ships to aid the Sicilians, I mean under Byzantine protectionist. Because why could they not send more and not really help the Sicilians? Because they were occupied with their failing attempts to establish control over the islands in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. It is in this context that the Byzantines executed their ferocious attack on the Egyptian town of Damietta in 853. They wanted to cut off the supply lines to Crete in an attempt to weaken the Arabs on the island. According to the chronicles, the Byzantines indeed took several hundreds of prisoners in Damietta to be sold as slaves and goods, including weapons that were destined for Crete. Let us return for a moment to the letter that referred to this unfortunate event with which I began my lecture. I quote, the governor has already left for Mahalla and Damietta, bringing with him a troop of cavalry as he received a letter from the caliph. Indeed, at the order of the caliph in Baghdad, the Arab governor in Egypt fortified Damietta and built up his naval defenses by conscripting Egyptians and demanding contributions. But the Byzantine fleet could wreak such havoc in Damietta and in other towns in the Egyptian Delta, precisely because Egypt had not kept a fleet of any significance since the Umayyad period. But the investments by the last Abbasid governor of Egypt and despite the caliph's involvement, did not make such a difference. The Egyptian navy, in fact, would only regain a relevance under the independent Fatimid dynasty in the second half of the 10th century. So the successful attack on Damietta had a lot to do with the Byzantine regained strength and ambition in the Mediterranean. But it also had a lot to do with a weakened caliphate, which did not have its military defenses in order. Paradoxically, it was the same weakness of the caliphate 
that made Egypt and its fleet strong again later on. We can see this phenomenon first in the western half of the Mediterranean and later also in Egypt and the Levant. By the 9th century, rulers in the Maghreb and Al-Andalus had already been successfully building a political and economic power base. For more than a century, these regions had been operating in ideological, financial, and political independence from the central caliphate. So in this ambivalent state, being part of the caliphate, but at the same time behaving independently. Cordoba, indeed, was at this time called a jewel, the jewel of the world, and not for nothing. In Al-Andalus, agriculture, including silk farming, boomed, with new products and irrigation techniques being introduced under Muslim rule. Artisans and scholars were attracted to the court at Cordoba, also coming from Baghdad. The Umayyad rulers invested heavily in public buildings, commerce, art, and scholarship. And across the sea in the Maghreb, Muslim merchants developed routes extending south into Africa that brought gold, slaves, and ivory. And these same effects of you know, independence and then but being part of the caliphate can be observed in the other provinces, exactly when independent rulers gained a hold there. In Ifriqiya, contemporary Tunisia, um, when it gained independence under the Ahlabids in 800, they conquered Sicily. The Fatimids, who replaced the Ahlabids in 901, were even able to establish an independent dynasty in Egypt and Syria. In 868, Ahmad ibn Tulun was appointed governor of Egypt. He established the first independent dynasty in Egypt and Syria, which continued to rule until 905, when these Fatimids came in again. The Tulunids, looking at Egypt, used the rich province's agricultural surplus, which no longer had to be transported to Baghdad in the form of taxes, to support growing economic and cultural activities within Egypt. And it is under the Tulunids that Egypt starts to develop its commercial infrastructure that connects it via the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, and which became, of course, especially successful under the Fatimids. These flourishing independent regional powers also attracted migrants from areas that did not fare so well, most notably the core of the caliphate, the city of an area around Baghdad. And this is the second way in which a weakening Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad influenced movements in the Mediterranean. The negative spiral of political unrest, economic collapse, and military instability that the Caliph's capital witnessed had a very different effect on the Mediterranean provinces than, for example, on the Central Asian markets of Bukhara. Remember the collapsing textile trade I mentioned before. Egypt had not been exporting as much to Baghdad as it had been importing via the Red Sea and Indian Ocean for internal consumption and transporting further into the Mediterranean, where demands had started to rise again. In fact, when Baghdad started to collapse, it is exactly Egypt that starts to attract artisans and merchants from Baghdad. The flourishing economy and safety in the province were very appealing. So we find in the 9th century an influx of Iraqis to Egypt, they did not only originate in Baghdad, but also in other towns, for example, Mosul and Tikrit. They brought with them to Egypt, to the extent that this was possible, their knowledge, skills, and businesses. Their influence is visible today in the stucco works that decorate the Ibn Tulum Mosque, top left, which are closely linked to the styles and used in Baghdad and Samarra at the time. It's like really striking, right? You see at the bottom there, Samarra, which is the city outside of Baghdad, palace city. And the same decorations can be found in the monastery of the Syrians in Wadi Natrun. Um, so that's on the right. So this is also a monastery of the Syrians, um, and the ones who speak Syriac. It's not, of course, coming from Syria, modern day Syria, but the ones who speak Syriac. Indeed, the migrants included a fair number of Iraqi Christians and Jews Amongst the oldest documents preserved in the Cairo Geniza are a small number of marriage contracts and marriage-related documents that were produced in Iraq and obviously brought to Egypt by the families to which the transcriptions applied. The fact that in Fatimid Egypt, Christians and Jews could reach high positions in the administration might have been an additional reason for these migrants to move to Cairo, 
But in general, it is clear that they came as part of the great waves of Iraqis who choose Egypt as their new home. The immigrants continued to maintain relations with Iraq. See, for example, the abbot Moses, also from Dara Suryan, who undertook a trip to the, in the 10th century to Iraq to buy manuscripts. And we have these manuscripts which in the colophon say, which are still in the monastery, mention that they were copied in 10th century Iraq at the order of the abbot Moses, who was there on a, on a, on a book buying trip. Also, in the migrants' names, a connection was maintained. So we have these nispas, such as al-Baghdadi or al-Mausuli, which become more frequent in papyri and also on epitaphs in the 9th and 10th centuries. And with the newcomers come also new products. In papyri from the 9th century, new products appear that arrived from the eastern part of the Muslim empire, such as sherbet ice cream, which is this little fragment. It says, give whatever you have in your hands of honey, which we're going to use for sherbet, which we need to use for sherbet and also references to Persian apples. The arrival of Iraqi merchants in Egypt surely led to the development or extension of commercial activity between the two regions. So to conclude, the Mediterranean operated in a global network. Interactions and exchanges across this network were so intense and voluminous that an entangled interconnectedness was created. As a result, Events at one end of the network, such as the collapse of political and economic structures in South Asia, Europe, or Iraq, or the cultivation of commercial and administrative structures in the Sasanian or early Muslim empire, were directly felt in other parts of the network. To acknowledge that such a global network existed at this time does not mean that this network did not undergo any changes. In fact, the intensity and focus of the network was very much affected by historical developments. The rise and fall of political powers and the related changes in the economic infrastructure and orientation impacted the nodes of activity in the network, where the focal points lay, how they were expressed, and their connections with surrounding political and social structures. It also does not mean that this extended region formed one uniform cultural zone. Products, people, and ideas moved throughout this area, but they were adapted to fit local conditions. In other words, they changed the local context, shaping their environment, just as they were shaped by it. So while cultural forms were shared across the globalized network, they, were always, uh, they always found a localized expression that was specific to the historical and regional context in which they were used. Similarly, if we examine events within this globalized network, we find that the Mediterranean and the movements across it could be impacted by processes that occurred very far away. The success of the Byzantine attack on Damietta, or the disastrous tragedy for the local population, can be explained by empire-wide Muslim policies, or perhaps better, the lack thereof, made as far away as Iraqi Baghdad. It was also uh, not having a good defense and not being able to really um, invest in a defense even under the last Abbasid governor. But it was also influenced by local circumstances, such as the rise in Byzantine naval activity. Byzantine and military and commercial activity, however, remained, as we saw, rather ineffective and limited in this early ninth century. But the same Baghdadi policies, or uh, being withdrawing actually of the caliphate from the provinces, gave independent dynasties, first in the western half of the Mediterranean and later in Egypt and Syria, room and resources to become the motors of the world economic system, as Laila Abu Luro has said, of the 9th and 11th centuries, uh, 9th to 11th centuries. Within this system, the Mediterranean operated in commercial networks extending from Western Europe to Africa, Arabia, and South Asia. I've tried to show you this afternoon what isolated objects and texts from the Mediterranean context can tell us when read in a globalization studies framework. How mobility and movement across and in the Mediterranean was impacted, not only by local circumstances, 
but how it was influenced by events and developments much further away. Thank you. and very entertaining talk. I'm sure we have questions. And if, uh, when you ask, could you please uh, give your name and affiliation? We have a room full of people still digesting your very, very uh, sort of information wealthy talk. Yes. <laughs> right, Amy. <laughs> Amy Remensnyder from Brown. Um, so thanks for that amazing talk. I wanted to ask a question at the level of you, you said you were gonna frame it in terms of theories of globalization. So I think my question is you've really beautifully shown how we can take a piece of local evidence that looks very different, that the historian's interpretation becomes very different when you place it in this global context. So I'm wondering if you think that we always need, need to be doing that. <laughs> Um, thank you for that question. Um, when we were talking before, I mentioned that I participated in this, which is really where the um, inspiration to look in this way um, uh, for, the, for uh, to in incorporate globalization uh, uh, studies frameworks when looking at my material ca came from two things. One, in uh, Leiden, we had a focus group or uh, emphasize with a, a group of people from archaeology, history, and um, area studies, uh, in which was called global, um, global studies. And so we looked at it, uh, it was really an eye-opener for me. And then the second thing was that I, part, I was asked to, work, to write a paper for this Routledge Handbook of Global Archaeology. And it's true that those people coming from very different periods and different, very different places, in the end, everyone saw globalization, globalized networks everywhere. So then the question is like, okay, how useful is it still? Because uh, ripple, ripple effects, you can, you can also call it, we've looked at it, and um, uh, connections like uh, uh, coins are found, Byzantine coins or pieces of glass are found in Japan and uh, everywhere things go around. So what, when, when do we, when do we really can use this um, um, globalized uh, global theory or, or uh, global studies framework? So I think the, the, the answer really lies in the level of intensity of the connections and the volume. And that's where I think there is in this whole period from the 6th to the 10th centuries, or even if you go into the Ottoman period, there are moments when it's definite, like I think this early reference that I gave, in the sixth and, and early up to the seventh century, there's definitely, uh, and you can see the effect happening um, there, and, and the connections are, the exchanges are really high, but I think in the Umayyad period, no. And so uh, and when you, so I don't think, I think we, sh we should look for it, but, but we can use it, but it doesn't mean it's, you can use it for any period. Um, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's not uh, like a classical period or prehistoric even. It's not disqualified from having a global network. But first of all, the global doesn't have to be encompassing the whole world, which it didn't in this period either. Huh? Abu Luro talks about a world economic system, but it doesn't include, of course, the Atlantic Ocean. So you can have a world system or a global system, which doesn't cover, obviously, but there's a... Uh, but it's about the... the the intensity and the volume of exchanges over an extended period, extended area, where you can see, as I said, I think that's the other key, when you see something happening on one side, it has an effect on the other side. So in that sense, the answer is that I think you, it can be present at any time and any place in a way, so it's, in that way it's, it's, I think, very useful to look at it because you see things differently, if it, but it doesn't mean that it's always in existence. Does that make sense? Because that's what I found a little bit the danger. Like now we were all looking and, and yeah, I found a pair of earrings here that were made in wherever and then suddenly we have a globalized system. But I don't think, because products can move very far, ideas, people can move very far, but it doesn't mean that there's a global network. Yeah. But I th for me it has really opened, 
yeah, it has really made me look at things differently because I would, we would never have looked at, you know, we were always uh, kind of um, struggling with this, seeing that something was happening in the seventh century in the Eastern Mediterranean. There was definitely, you know, more localized economies in some places there were still monasteries built and mosaics in synagogues and churches being developed. Uh, so there was still very um, localized, um, active economic uh, or is that activity. But at the same time, things were changing. So we were always like, okay, there's locally, things were still well, good, but as a whole, it wasn't. And I think in this way, it, it gives actually a nice explanation that it's not so much about this region not having money anymore to do things, and that's why they're doing less and getting less stuff from outside, but it's because something is happening very far away. So in that sense, it really made a difference. Yeah. Other questions? No, I think it was the lady here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Hisugli Ninoya. I'm independent, but I'm working with e-commerce. Uh, my question to you, this is a very general question. You mentioned about the wine production uh, in the Mediterranean world. There is Islamic countries, there is a Christian countries. Whether they import or export, it doesn't matter. But just in general, generally, Islam doesn't allow drink. Mm. Okay? So when they import, when they produce the wine, they must taste although they don't write in the tangibly, but intangibly they had to drink whatever. So how, 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 just my question, how could we be partial, how, not a partial, how could we do what's going on between this kind of, whether it is a forbidden, however they have to import or export. Hmm. So how would you explain? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this question. It also connects to the, actually the, um, what I mentioned about the activ activity about silk. So, I mean, I can answer it for, for wine and silk, but I'll... I'll um, so, of course, there's a... You can, the easy question is, or the easy answer is, there's a difference between theory and practice, right? So, then there's... that. So that you can say, okay, wine, alcohol was forbidden, silk was forbidden, but they still do it, for whatever reason. And then there are studies who actually look at that, well, you know, was it really forbidden or how forbidden was it? Uh, so are there different interpretations and were people following? I mean, it's clear from the evidence that there was a lot of wine um, produced and consumed, as I say, including at the Calaifo court um, and presumably by lots of other people. At the same time, we have these uh, legal discussions that um, debate when, uh, how and when you're allowed to use it. So, and then I think for silk, it's even in a way, um, the example is even clearer because as I said, there's a, uh, in the Byzantine Empire and we even also in the Chinese uh, contemporary uh, Tang uh, dynasty, silk was limited to the, to the highest social layers. People, huh? Only, only uh, even in, in the Byzantine Empire, it was really for the imperial, um, in the imperial ranks that silk was allowed, and, and the, the highest civil servants. In, in the Islamic Empire, you don't have this restriction on the use of silk. But in fact, silk also, you're not supposed to wear. Huh? You have silk in paradise, it's related in Quran that you um, in, in, in paradise, you're, you're dressed in silk, but on earth, the, the jurists have said, no, you shouldn't, be, shouldn't wear silk. You can only wear it when you have skin disease or something like that, because it's too precious, right? At the same time, we see, as I mentioned before, that the, that the production of silk or the consumption of silk increases dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> People found a way, or they perhaps, I don't think they all had skin disease, so they, you know, they, <laughs> they come up with a reason of why, an explanation of why they use it. Of course, also, we, we have these, uh, there's then a debate that the, the, the amount of silk that you can have on a, on a garment or something, so you have these tiras, these, these bands of decorated silk, which is allowed, and you see that everywhere. But, you know, whether anyone went around with a measuring tape, I mean, it's clear that people, wanted silk and so it was produced. <laughs>
and, and trade it. And the same is true for, for wine. Yeah. Okay, the lady over there. And while she waits, I read an article this morning about um, speaker gender in, in conferences I mean, in, and how it relates to audience members um, asking questions. And they said that when a woman is speaking, it's usually women asking questions. Yeah. So anecdotally, that's absolutely right. And I would encourage the male members of the audience perhaps also to think of a question. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, I'm Avital Heyman, uh, independent, but uh, from Aga Museum of Art. Uh, I'm sure that you, uh, you are familiar with the great contribution of Professor David Jacobi, uh, who recently, unfortunately, died uh, regarding uh, his many publications about uh, silk, uh, one of his uh, uh, major uh, publications was actually called uh, uh, Silk Crosses the Mediterranean, in which he showed uh, so many interesting uh, reactions as uh, spectators, namely uh, Muslim, Byzantine, and Latin uh, interactions regarding artifact of silk of whatever kind, and then, of course, in the Crusader Kingdom. Uh, for example, also in the county of Antioch, he just uh, located uh, interesting, very interesting uh, reactions uh, of uh, what we call today, uh, you know, the other. And uh, it was very interesting uh, what, he showed, uh, what he showed us, but I think that apart from what Amy just uh, referred to, uh, the glo globalization uh, network, or whatever that you may call it. I think that there is also a certain a, a, a kind of, a, of hier hierarchy, namely that, uh, for example, in, in medieval Spain, when you find a Muslim objects a, that served, for example, uh, in the sanctuary on the altar, that you can find uh, also Kufic, uh, let's say, uh, uh, inscriptions, and then you can also find uh, the artifact itself, I mean, box that would serve for relics, let's say, which is so holy. And then it has, it's like that uh, when Rome uh, took uh, Egypt, so they just brought obelisks, obelisks to Rome to show that they conquered it. In this respect of insertion, so there is also this hierarchy of society, I think, not only globalization in the, in the respect that artifacts, objects would cross the Mediterranean this way or the other, and not only the Mediterranean, other uh, seas as well. So uh, I'm sure that you could uh, elaborate on that uh, direction. Thank you. Of course, well, there are several papers, I think, on uh, relics crossing uh, the Mediterranean and also from Islamic to um, uh, I said that Christian worlds uh, in the conference as planned, I noticed in the, in the schedule. So, um, and uh, of course, there are two sides to it. There's the side of respect and admiration, and there's the triumphal, I said that, uh, um, taking it from the other side and using it especially in and, and and I think we can see it also in the reuse of uh, Fatimid rock crystal objects yeah, and it especially I remember several nice ones in uh, St. Mark's um, uh, is that uh, treasury in, in Venice but of course elsewhere so it's always these two sides that play a role but, but I think when you start to see exactly what you're saying, the imitation Kufic being produced in European workshops, or even the other way around, we have from a bit later periods, from Egypt again in the Mamluk period, there start to become brass objects, uh, with the inlaid brass objects, metal objects, the Mamluks were very famous for their metal work, of course, being produced in workshops in the Mamluk Egypt for the European market. I think there, there's a genuine, uh, you can say, interest, 
popularity, I don't think it has to be, uh, but, but appreciation of these objects as, um, yeah, as, as art objects, or what you call it, material art objects. And I don't think there, there's an issue of, you know, look, I'm buying a mom look, um, bowl with a with a with a Latin inscription and it's it's like conquering the Mamluks. I don't think there that plays a role. So I think in some contexts it is ambivalent or both things play a role, but there are other contexts where I think it's straightforward appreciation of these objects. I think for the Mamluk case, I mean it also shows that you know there's a, a obvious turnaround of the where the demand lies. Huh? These Mamluk artisans making products for the European market. The world has turned, definitely turned around by the 14th century, 14th, 15th century. Mm. <laughs> uh, hello, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Joel Patterson, um, and I'm with the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I just have a, a quick question. Um, uh, I was wondering if you, you, you mentioned um, as, as one of the sort of commodities that um, connected the Mediterranean with much wider worlds, uh, the passage of slaves. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about slavery as um, a category to explain globalization, and particularly perhaps to address the um, what seems to me an interesting issue whereby we seem to have an early medieval discussion of slavery, I'm thinking of especially of Michael McCormick, and then a sort of, to my mind, almost disconnected later medieval discussion of um, particular slave uh, systems, such as the, the, the Black Sea trade, the uh, Mamluk Egypt, or the um, Sub-Saharan African trade. So I'm wondering whether you can talk about slavery as a sort of pan-medieval um, uh, connecting issue, especially as a, as a vehicle to create knowledge and control knowledge of these very wide networks. And of course, as one, um, as a trade that uh, creates an uh, enormous literature, enormous medieval literature. So, thank you. Yeah, wow. Um, thank you for that question. I mean, slavery, I think for, for in the Islamic um, studies, or yeah, Islamic medieval studies, as a, um, especially for the early or early medieval period, and as looking at it from a socio-economic point of view, is not really um, looked at as much at all. I mean, the, exactly what you say, the focus has been in, on the Mamluk system. Of course, there's an economic aspect dimension to that, but on like household slaves or, or just slavery in the, in the economy beyond the army, there's not that much attention paid to it. Of course, there's Marek from Oxford, I think now he is, no? I, what's his last? Anyway, uh, who, is, who has done this tremendously interesting work of finding these um, uh, or, or, or actually explaining the, the huge amounts of, of uh, dinars that are found in, in Eastern Europe, if you want, uh, by uh, saying this is like a, represents a huge slave trade uh, movement on that side, which is on an earlier period than when we have the big Mamluk armies. Uh, but we don't, uh, from, the, from the Muslim empire point of view, like very little has been done. Um, and also, if I look at uh, uh, actually a colleague of mine, Jelle Brüning in Leiden, has just been looking and, and working on, on slaves in the papyri, the early ones, and there are not many references. So it's kind of strange. I mean, this is, or not strange. We have to kind of come up with a different way of seeing the, the slaves in the economy, but we don't see them as commodity traded in the, um, in the, in the papyri a lot. Um, and as you say, like the, the focus has definitely been on the um, legal, theological side of explaining, or of, of discussion of, of the slavery, and not so much on it as a in in the in the economic system of the early period. So actually, no, I cannot <laughs> use slavery to look at these networks. But it, it must have played a role, I think. Um, but we just haven't made, that, made it visible yet. So it's something to really look at. Because, yeah, and when I say also they go to Africa to get slaves, <laughs> this is what, the, what comes from the chronicles more. But no, it has not been uh, looked at sufficiently. But, um, yeah, they obviously went yeah, across huge distances also. Yeah. 
Um, the time is up now. Do you want us to do another five minutes? Or? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, can I abuse my privileges chair? I really appreciated um, the, the contemporary reference you had. Sort of, I think our Brexit politician, uh, like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, would really like the comparison between the EU and the Islamic States. <laughs> uh, of the rise of the uh, local dynasties in the ninth century. Can I just ask what sort of structures and institutions were sort of helped to maintain the norms in these local dynasties? I mean, what sort of, you know, yeah. structures were there? Well, I think, so the, 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 the movement of scholars, and, and when we say scholars, you know, they, of course, uh, they're legal scholars, but they, all, they did everything else as well. Through these, through the Islamic world, I mean, they, go, they don't go... They don't, they're not limited by um, dynastic boundaries or even uh, religious uh, boundaries, if you want. Like, you know, they don't not go to the Fatimid court because they're Shiites or something, or Ismailis. So I think uh, scholars move around, um, uh, and, and obviously where, the, where, uh, where there are courts or patrons that um, are willing to pay them, they settle and they um, work and develop their theories further. So I think that's not that's one structure that uh, or, or one element that creates a um, yeah a, a network, if you want, that ties together the Islamic Empire beyond these um, yeah if you want political uh, or across these political boundaries. Um, I think traders as well. They and of course there's. And uh, we, we call them either traders or scholars or pilgrims or adventurers, but often th these things went together, um, obviously. So traders as well, they move around from one place to the other and they're not going to be stopped by, again, political or religious boundaries. So they bring with them, and we, we focus more on goods always, but I think techniques is a very important element that goes also from one place to the other. And they also bring their, the ideas they've heard from in one place or another. And they bring, I say that, uh, I think that's also something, um, uh, we think of these ships with merchandise going from one place to the other, but when we look at, um, and that's all that's left when we have a shipwreck, when we excavate a shipwreck, but when we look at the uh, anecdotal, or I say that, um, literary evidence, we see that these ships also brought, you know, other travelers came, uh, joined, uh, went along on these ships. They hitched a ride. And so they moved from one place of the, um, in the Islamic empire and beyond to, to another. So I think those are also, and I think this is the interesting element that these are of course totally networks, totally independent from the political caliphal network, if you want. So we think of governors, judges, um, uh, other officials being sent out from the from the caliphal capital, and when that stops to be happening, when that stops to happen, when you have these independent dynasties that no longer need, uh, they don't need to be get a governor from the center because they have their own dynasty, then we see this this influence from the capital diminishing. But we forget that, like, I mean, these guys that I said, these refugees from Iraq coming to Egypt, they bring all sorts of things with them, and they they are traders, and they exploit also the networks they have, continue to have with Iraq and the other communities that they come from. So, but it's, uh, it's no longer the kind of the, the, the political administrative system that connects these areas. So I think it's much more in these, yeah, other groups that we should look for, for the connecting mm -hmm. fabric of the Islamic empire that continues. And, and that's why I think, you know, having one legal system with, with all the variants that we have, one, literary system. I mean, it's still in, in the Andalusian court, poets respond to and know the works of their fellow poets all the way on the other side. And Central Asian uh, fuqaha, judge, uh, jurists, are famous for developing Islamic law, but their works are commented on in other places of the Muslim world. So um, having this one um, intellectual, cultural, and economic system also. I mean, you have different dinars struck in different places, but it's still, and, and the tax system is now collected locally, but it's still in terms and references that everyone knows. Uh, Ibn Jubair might complain when he comes from Al-Andalus and he goes to Mecca, he might be complaining that the Egyptian uh, local administrators are taking 
um, sadaka from him, so they're taking uh, alms taxes from him. Um, but he still knows what it is, and he can, you know, it's all the same terminology and the same system in a way. So I think that that makes uh, that, that connects this area. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Please join me again thanking Petra for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Mm -hmm.